It is great to see. Uh, we've uh, met some uh, people that we haven't seen for a long time and some unusual uh, uh, situations of paths crossing here. So it's been a delight to be here and I am very humbled to uh, have the opportunity to, to speak with you and to, to share with you. Uh, I feel a little inadequate for the task and uh, yet uh, that's exactly where the Lord wants us at many times. I am a professor at Moody Bible Institute and uh, uh, yes, I am one of those that are uh, characterized as being absent-minded. Uh, absolutely true, just ask my wife. <laughs> uh, my all-time favorite uh, story is about uh, two men that uh, were talking about a seminar they had been to, one of them had been to, and, and he'd been to this memory enhancement seminar, and uh, the other one had not been, and they were talking about it, and he said it was just a really great seminar, it really benefited me quite a bit. Well, the second man said, you know, well, you know, how did it work? Well, the first man said, well, you, you take something that's really difficult to, to memorize and remember, and then you take something that's really easy, that comes to mind really quickly, and you make some kind of an association between the two, so that when you're trying to think of that thing that doesn't come to mind, you, you, immediately something comes to mind that's really familiar, and then you make that association, and then you remember the thing that you just couldn't remember very well. Oh, the second man said, you know, that's really wonderful, you know, why well, I'd like to really go to a seminar like that. What's the name of that seminar? The first man said, oh, the name of the seminar, oh no, uh, green um, uh, stem, thorn, uh, red rose, 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 what was the name of that seminar we went to? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to know, am I like that? Uh, I am. <laughs> I get involved in some details and forget some of the uh, broad picture at times and my wife keeps me straight. Well, this morning or this afternoon, we're going to be talking about uh, how we energize our faith. And really, we're talking about the problem of James chapter 2, and, and certainly that comes up quickly, doesn't it, in a conversation when we're talking about saving faith. Someone will immediately bring up uh, James 2, and the cultists do, uh, Roman Catholics do quickly, but amazingly, evangelicals should have an answer to it, but they still are problemized by this particular passage as well. Unfortunately, uh, sometimes the evangelical approach to this is not any more helpful than uh, they should be. They, they certainly should be, but they're not more helpful for us. And they approach it from a, a false faith, true faith, generally a, a kind of a perspective. And we think that this is really inadequate. Basically, they're telling us that when you come to James chapter 2, that true faith always results in some kind of consistent good works in the life of a believer. If this person is truly saved, then he should have some evidence in his life, and it should be consistent, not just sporadic. And that word consistent is a crucial word here. They quickly bring up uh, various passages within the uh, 214 to 26 range there, such as 214. You know, can such a faith save this person, a faith that's without works. Certainly we must be talking about true faith versus false faith or genuine faith versus spurious faith in this passage. And then quickly they'll go to 217 about dead faith. We've all heard that one. Well, faith that's just an intellectual faith is a dead faith. And we are so ingrained with this that it's somewhat like uh, blinders on an Amish horse so that we're almost incapable of seeing anything else in the passage but what we've always heard in all of these books and all these commentaries. And it's very, very difficult, I find, even in the classroom, to prod students' thinking to even come to the passage of James and look at any way afresh with some objectivity without having preconceived ideas. If we approach James chapter 2 as if it is talking about true faith versus false faith, and true faith will always result in consistent good works. And if you don't have enough good works in your life, then you're probably not a Christian. And then it seems to me there's only two responses that I have as a reader of that passage, as a listener to that passage. One response is to say, I'm a Christian, and uh, I know I have enough good works in my life, and therefore, I guess this passage really is talking about non-Christians. It's not talking to me. There's nothing really, this is a theological discussion. Isn't that rather dangerous? <laughs> and it seems to me we're actually missing the very impact 
of James chapter 2. Of course, another response is just as weak and just as detrimental to the Christian. And that is if he should examine James 2 as a false faith, true faith idea, and he comes up with the, the idea that he himself doesn't quite have enough good works in his life, and he says, well, you know, I thought I was a Christian. I thought I trusted Christ as my Savior, and I've been going to church and doing this, but, you know, now I'm not sure if I have enough good works in my life to, to really show I am a true Christian. I don't know if I'm really going to heaven when I die. Now, that's just as devastating as the other. If we're talking about complacency versus insecurity, both are harmful to the Christian life. And you know what? We miss the very impact of James chapter 2, where James is writing to Christian readers to incite within them the desire to do more good deeds and more good works. When's the last time you've been challenged to do more good works in your life without somehow someone challenging your Christian faith and whether or not you've been born again? I want you to notice that uh, James is dealing with issues that are very, very relevant to the American evangelical church in the 20th century. And if there's any more book that's more relevant to James, I'm not sure, than to our culture than James, I'm not sure which one it is. And we need to hear as Christians, evangelical Christians, the message that James has to say. One problem, obviously, is worldliness that he mentions. Right there in James 4, he talks about being friends with the world. Here they're married to Christ and they're dating and flirting with the world. (laughs) Do you think God takes that in a pleasing way? He is a jealous God, he implies in the following verses. Not only that, but we have a group of people that idealize wealth. And one of their idols is making money. Chapter 4 says, there's some people that actually say, today and tomorrow we're going to such and such a city, we're going to spend a year there, we're going to buy and sell, and we're going to make a profit. Hey, boy, I'm going to make some money, I've got this great investment going. And they're longing for financial things. Isn't it easy when the money is coming in and uh, we, we kind of like that and we idealize it to be a little extra stingy in meeting the needs of people who could use some material help? Well, I think, as I said, there's very few books that are more relevant. We can look at various other problems the church or churches that James is writing to have. This idea of a false faith versus a true faith just seems to fly against everything that's right there in front of us in the book of James itself. There's at least two passages that are just really clear to me that he's addressing true Christians. Right before this section of 2.14 about faith and works together, he says, for example, my brothers as believers, excuse me, that's 2.1, my brothers as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ don't show favoritism. Is there any thought here that he's saying, if you show favoritism, you're not a true Christian? And that misses the point by a mile. And then right before he introduces this section in 2.14, he says, So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty, the law of freedom, the law of love and forgiveness. I submit to you this this afternoon, can a non-Christian so speak and so act like one who's going to be judged by this law of freedom? It's impossible. He has not experienced the law of freedom yet, his forgiveness in Christ. So all the way through, James is addressing true Christians. Elsewhere, the scriptures make it fairly clear to us, too, that not all Christians live a consistent godly life, do they? And not all Christians produce the good works that we should expect in their lives. No more clear passage for this is found than in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The amazing thing is that we could be fooled by a Christian's good works, thinking that indeed they prove that he's a genuine Christian. When God says sometimes those good works will one day appear in a future evaluation and not be pleasing to God, and therefore not evaluated as good works in his eyes, because God is going to judge our motives and the quality of our works 
1 Corinthians 3 says. And here's the kind of a person where he says, has truly made it to heaven. And yet, his works, maybe many of them, maybe most of them, somehow are burned up in an evaluation and are not rewardable. How do we fit that into a theology of false faith versus true faith in James chapter 2? It just does not fit. And I'm sure that you know and realize that there are so many other passages that suggest the very same thing. There are three correct perspectives that uh, we can approach James 2 with, and I think that they will be very helpful to us, and we need to look at them more carefully. First of all, James 2.14 and following is talking about how easy it is for us to speak our faith without doing our faith because speaking our faith without doing doesn't meet practical needs. His illustration in James 2, right after 2.14, is very clear. Notice, first of all, he's addressing true Christians. If a brother or sister, that is, my brother or sister, my Christian brother or sister, now, if either I am not a Christian or you are not a Christian, then I can't call you a brother or a sister. Either one of those cancels out this equation. And then to make it very clear, a little later on, he says, if one among you, brothers and sisters, Christians, say, notice the emphasis, and you say to this person who is in desperate need of food and clothing, you say, Lord bless you, I'm going to be praying for you, I have faith that God will care for you. (laughs) Bye, see you later. Sorry, I don't have time. Can my faith help them? The answer is no. Words can't help the needs. Only deeds help the needs of another person like that. A second corrective, a correct perspective on James 2 is that faith which is invisible can be seen through our good works. Now please don't un- misunderstand me to be saying somehow that these works must be visible to prove that I have faith. That's not the issue. But when we see someone who confesses Christ doing good deeds, we can say of that person, there's a person who is really trusting God. We can see their faith. James brings this out several times because he has been challenged about the issue of showing faith. And there's this imaginary objector, probably one of the teachers in the assembly, uh, or several of them, It said, you can't see faith. I dare you to show me faith through work. You can't see it. And he says, wait a minute, you can. He says, you can see that. A third perspective, correct perspective, is that when good works are added to our faith, our faith in Christ is matured. And here most of our versions use the word perfected, and it might be helpful to to translate it by matured so that we might get the right, right idea. Notice in the discussion of Abraham who added works to his faith that when the two were cooperating together, his faith matured. Now it strikes me as odd that if we're talking about true faith versus false faith and you need good works to prove that you have faith, why would he use an illustration in the life of Abraham that took place nearly 35 years after he first was justified by faith? Did it take him 35 years to prove that he was a true believer? (laughs) I don't think so. And I would also like to submit that I doubt if many Christians, given the same command that Abraham was given to offer up his son Isaac, would have obeyed God and, quote, so proved their faith by their good works. That just really doesn't fit in the passage. Now, one of the reasons we can come at uh, James as not talking about a true faith versus false faith issues is that uh, I've learned over the years that uh, one of the little key hermeneutical guidelines or helps in studying an epistle is that the introduction generally has in seed form, in in miniature form, all the main ideas that the author wants to get at in the rest of his book. 
And it acts for me like a check and balance system. If I, I'm interpreting a section in the epistle and I can't quite find it in the introduction, I've come to, to, to learn that I better check out my interpretation and re, re-examine myself on these issues. And then only that is being true, but I find that to actually get the theme of the book, an epistle now, it's helpful sometimes to compare the introduction and the conclusion. And if there's something in harmony there, that's going to be the over, overriding concern of the author. Well, you know, as you come to the first several verses and maybe even the first 10 or 12 verses of James, there's really nothing in there that challenges us in a false faith, true faith issue. Notice, for example, in chapter 1, he says that we are encountering trials and that when trials come into our life, there's the opportunity, if we respond right, to endure them. And once we endure them, we will become matured. In chapter 5, we return to the idea of trials and enduring trials and suffering and the need for that endurance and that God blesses those who do to endure trials. So there seems to be no big picture about true Christians versus false Christians, but when trials come into our life, do we endure? If we don't endure, we're going to, going to be an immature person. If we will respond in, in faith and joy and endurance, then our faith is mature. It's interesting of Abraham, as uh, Zane Hodges points out in several of his books, that at the very first moment when he trusted God for justification by faith alone and received righteousness, he believed in a God of resurrection, that God could bring life to his dead body and produce a child. But that very faith, which took no works at all, no proof needed, was tested in the offering up of Isaac so that in Hebrews we're told that he believed that God could raise him from the dead. His faith was matured in the process. So here we see the introduction and the conclusion in harmony, but no hints of true faith versus false faith. Well, how does the introduction then contribute to James chapter 2? Well, notice that we have a theme here in James chapter 1 about maturing faith. Now, what's the opposite of maturing faith? False faith? Oh, please. (laughs) We're talking about immature faith versus mature faith, not true faith versus false faith. And as we've already shown, we must allow that to impact James chapter 2. James has introduced his theme in chapter chapter 1 in the introduction. Now he is developing it in the life of Abraham. Furthermore, I think that we might find here in James, actually a a minor theme, a sub-theme for the book of maturity and mature faith. Because right after that major section we're talking about in James 2, immediately, James says in in chapter 3, verse 2, that if anyone doesn't stumble, stumble in his tongue, he is a mature man. That runs through James, chapter 2. Now, I I enjoy asking my classes to do this little analogy, and those of you who are well-read know what I'm getting to, uh, but some others perhaps uh, don't know what I'm getting to. And I'd like you to take this body, and it has a a spirit, uh, this, this person has a spirit and a body to it, and I want you to match up the words faith, the concept of faith, with the concept of works. It's an analogy, and and what would faith normally go with? Spirit or body, and what would works normally go with? And you're thinking, if you don't know where I'm going, you're thinking, uh, yes, faith would normally be the spirit, and and works would normally be the body, because, you know, as you do works, you have to have faith that that, uh, is behind it, otherwise it's not pleasing to the Lord, that which is not of faith is sin. And uh, I'll give you an A in class for that, because that's very good Pauline theology. It's exactly what Paul says in many places. Faith working through love. Okay. Yes, any good deed must have behind it faith for it to be pleasing to God. The problem is that we superimpose that idea onto James chapter 2. 
And we come with that idea, trying to read James that way, and it doesn't work. James's perspective is just the opposite of that. He says works goes with the spirit and faith with the body, so that here is faith and the spirit that enlivens faith is works. Notice his analogy in James 2.26. Just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Imagine two Bible studies discussing evangelism. One group that is uh, uh, talking about it but uh, not doing it. And another group that has been actively sharing their faith. Can you sense any difference in the vitality of the spirit in those groups? <laughs> sure we can. What is it that vitalizes and, and enlivens the one group but not the other. It's that not only are they doing the talking of evangelism, they are doing the work of evangelism. And it enlivens their faith. That's what James is talking about. Well, there are several problems that arise to that kind of an idea. Those from a true faith, false faith background would say, wait a minute. I mean, there's a lot of explanation to do in the passage. Problem number one. Doesn't James 2.14 refer to a false faith that doesn't save? It does use the word save. What can we do with that? Can that faith save him? We have, um, again, approach uh, the word saved, and I think many of us in, in these circles now are becoming aware of that idea that, that we read into the word saved always being delivered from hell and, and eternal damnation unfairly. And uh, because of that prejudice brought to this passage, several other translators try to help us out. And they're thinking only of being delivered from eternal damnation. And so they help us out here that, uh, by suggesting, can that faith or, faith, or can such a faith, or can that kind of faith save this person, a faith without works? Uh, I appreciate their motivation, uh, but I think it really doesn't help us much at all. It produces two kinds of faith, a false faith and a true faith, when I think most of us are beginning to understand that there's only two things in the New Testament, faith and no faith. Let's call it what it is. Instead of calling it false faith, let's just say the person did not believe in Christ as their Savior. It's not false faith. And those words aren't used in the Scriptures. And so we think that, uh, yes, several other translations are, are correct with the... Uh, the Greek, just, just doing quite well. King James, New King James, even the New Revised Standard Version. Can faith save him? But if we maintain that the saved is getting to heaven, now we have a real contradiction with Paul, don't we? A real difficulty that we're all trying to escape. Perhaps, just perhaps, the saved in James ought to be approached in some different way. Let's rethink that. Now, I try to teach my students that we need to take the word salvation and save, just kind of wipe that out of our mind, and immediately replace it with the word deliver and deliverance. When we do that, then we are not approaching the passage with some kind of blinders that automatically confuse us. If I was to come out of uh, a lake, dripping wet next to a lifeguard, and I said, he just saved me. Would you suppose that I meant that I was going to heaven now as a result of that? No, you would have said I was delivered from drowning and from physical death. If I came out of a bank next to a financial advisor and I said, I just about invested my whole life savings, but whew, he saved me. You wouldn't suppose that I just got born again. <laughs> you would understand that I was delivered from financial disaster. And the New Testament uses, and the Old Testament uses that word just as flexibly as we do in everyday English. We need to tra transform our thinking and then come to this passage or any passage and ask, okay, it means deliverance. Now, deliverance from what? And let me drive home the thought that the from what can never be found in the Greek word or the English word. It's just not there in the word. It's in the context. 
Now, I've, I've read several objections to this kind of idea. Oh, the saved in James 2, 14 must be talking about getting to heaven for several reasons. And they bring up several objections. One article I remember reading said, well, look at the judgment that, that is mentioned just in the verse before. Clearly, it's a judgment without mercy. So obviously, we're talking about getting to heaven or not getting to heaven. And I said, no, wait a minute. Chapter 3, verse 1, which is the immediately following context, says, James speaking, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Now, did you hear that? <laughs> James said he was going to be judged. And his judgment was going to be stricter as a teacher. What happens here is there's a literary convention in this section that kind of like forms brackets. It begins this 214 to 26 unit and it ends the 214 to 26 unit. And the 213 and 31 must go together. We're talking about the same judgment. We are talking about a believer's judgment. Isn't it amazing how uh, frequently people think that there's going to be one general judgment where we're all gathered together to determine our eternal destiny? Now, when we think through that a little bit, it really doesn't make sense. Here I am, and all of my friends, and all of you, and we all die, let's say, before the Lord comes back. Where do we go? We go into the presence of Christ. And then all God gathers all the people out of the temporary place of torment, hell, let's call it hell, and, and all the people in heaven. He gathers them all together, mixes them all up, and then says, you belong to heaven, you belong to hell. Well, let me ask you a question. Has he made any mistakes along the way? <laughs> Has he gotten somebody into heaven who doesn't really deserve there, and now they come to the final judgment and says, oh, by the way, you, you go to heaven. If you don't know now, you'll know the moment you die, but I know now I'm going to heaven, and there's no need for this general judgment to determine my eternal destiny. And as John says, that judgment is past. But there is an evaluation of believers, as believers who are already bound for heaven and will be in heaven, to determine, like teachers, the responsibility that God has laid upon them and the accountability that he's laid on them. And so this unit is bracketed by a, a mention of judgment, which is a judgment of believers. Another objection is to say, well, the word saved is used so frequently of getting to heaven that it really, that, that's, you can't mean anything else. Now, we could examine whether it's really that frequent or not. But what is interesting, it is under that majority use rule. You know, the majority of uses ought to determine it in any passage. Under that rule we would have to make James chapter 5 talk about getting to heaven. When James says, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. Modern translations, uh, evangelical translations, realize that this doesn't mean to get to heaven. And so they use some other word there, like this will restore, or will heal the person who is sick. What are we talking about here? We're talking about deliverance from physical death. And we can't use the majority use rule here. <laughs> the majority use is this is what it means. No, the context says we're talking about a deliverance from eternal or from uh, a physical death. Just looking at a few other uses within the book, there are actually five uses. Look at James chapter 4, verse 12, where James says, There is one who is able to save and to destroy. At first, we might imply, well, he's talking about he's able to get you to heaven or send you to hell. But if we read the following context, we realize, realize he's talking about people who are planning to go to a far country or a distant land of some sort, make a business, and engage in, in that business, and they don't take into consideration that they may die. That their life is short and is quickly vanishing, and instead they ought to say, if the Lord wills, then we will live. <laughs> To save and to destroy is talking about whether God is, will preserve our earthly life or take our life. And we need to bring that into consideration. Now, we don't have time to go into the other uses, but I'd like to suggest that there's really no clear-cut case in James chapter, and all of James, of the five uses. 
that could be shown clearly that it must relate to our eternal destiny in heaven. None of the five have to clear cut. In fact, I'm convinced that they all five probably relate to deliverance from physical death. So the very good reasons why James chapter 2 is talking about if you have faith but you don't have deeds, the devastations of sin are coming into your life and they won't prevent you from having an early physical death. Now, some people, they don't get the impact of that and it sounds like, oh, wait a minute, physical death? Hey, no big deal. I mean, we go to heaven, don't we? And that's because we're not well steeped like the Jewish readers of James are in the Old Testament. Of the commandments, Ten Commandments, which one is the commandment with a promise? Honor your father and mother. What's the promise? Live a long life. Now, had you ever reasoned that obeying your parents would help you live a long life and not bring on a short death or a quick death? Probably not. But the Bible does and God does. And we need to reorient our thinking with that kind of a principle. A second problem is James 2.19. Someone would say, well, wait a minute. Surely James is talking about true faith versus false faith because, I mean, look, the demons, they believe too. That's a false faith, isn't it? Well, there's some very good reasons, three of them exactly, to reconsider what James 2.19 is talking about and whether or not it actually applies to the issues of true faith versus false faith or not. First of all, I want you to note that the content under discussion in James 2.19 is not saving faith. Before I show you the text, note that the text doesn't say you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The demons believe that. What does the text say? You believe that there's one God. The demons believe that there's one God too. Now wait a minute. Do you know anyone that believes that there's one God but doesn't believe in Christ? and gets to heaven. No. You see, this isn't the content needed to get to heaven. So what we're doing by pulling this out of the passage and comparing it with saving faith is comparing proverbial apples and oranges, aren't we? This is really not the issue under discussion. I know lots of Jewish people that believe that God is one, but the problem isn't in their faith. The problem is in the content of their faith. They are not believing that Jesus is the Christ. A second reason why this passage is inadequate to use for true faith versus false faith is that demons don't have salvation if they believe in Christ. Let's even suppose that the text said, you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The demons believe that too. Let's suppose that demons believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now, do they get born again? No. Hebrews tells us pretty clearly. There is no faith, there is no salvation for demons. So again, we're comparing apples and oranges. You cannot, listen, you cannot compare the demonic world with the human world when it comes to saving faith. I don't know any passage, actually, that clearly tells us that demons actually trust that Jesus is their Savior. <laughs> they can't, because they know that he has not died for them. But finally, it's interesting that the words in this passage, the demons believe and also shudder, may not be actually the words of James himself. They may be in the mouth of the imaginary objector in this passage. And I'll get to that in a second. This is a very, very, very difficult passage, and I know several commentators have said this is the most difficult passage in the New Testament. And I'm not going to try to describe it very much except to show how it doesn't relate to true faith versus false, false faith uh, theology. I want you to note, first of all, the differences in a number of different versions as to how far the quotes go of this imaginary person that says, someone will say, that's the imaginary person. It's an imaginary opponent that James suggests. There's someone out there that's going to say this, he says. And they say, you have faith and I have deeds. That's an evangelical translation, NIV. But notice the NASV carries the quotes much farther. You know what this tells us? 
This tells us that the Greek doesn't have any solution to this. There's no quote marks in Greek, and it's a matter of interpretation. On top of that, it was interesting that there's even another version that carries the translation, even the quote marks, even further. This is the Weymouth version of 1923, and notice where the quote marks are. Here, these quote marks show that it may be that the imaginary objector, an opponent of James, is actually the one that says the demons believe in Shudder. Now, dare we make theology out of that if it's not from the mouth of James but from one of his opponents? I dare say that we better avoid making any theology out of that that's serious. And so, again, not to explain it this morning, it seems to me there's very good reasons that the faith of demons here under discussion is not an illustration of intellectual faith, of false faith, spurious faith, or any other kind of thing like that. How can we decide how far the quotes go, then? And uh, Zane has given us insights on this in some of his writings. There's two other places where we have responses to an imaginary objector in the New Testament. And I want you to note, in each case, the, uh, the response by Paul, or someone else, Paul here, the response is always marked out by some uh, label of condemnation of that person. You fool! Oh, man, who are you? And if we took that back into the James passage, do you notice down here, if you can see my cursor, but idle boaster, oh, fool, that's where James's response begins. And we think that Weymouth has caught the quote marks right. Now, I hope that that's not too deep for you this, this afternoon because uh, this is a very, very difficult passage, as we've said already. James responds to this imaginary objector by saying, you can see faith. You want to challenge me to show you faith? I'll show it to you. Look at Abraham. Look at Rahab. You can see faith in their deeds. They were justified before other people by their works. Well, a third objection to the, taking this passage the way we are is found in 224. Our friend says, isn't James saying that if you are truly justified by faith, you will do good works? Doesn't it say you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone? Well, you need to understand that there are three kinds of justification in Scripture. Uh, first of all, let's get a definition. To be justified means to be declared righteous. To be declared righteous. The first kind of justification is justification by faith. We're all clear in this. It's obviously a Pauline truth, and this justification is in the sight of God. And notice in Romans, several times, Paul says, we are justified in the sight of God. God can see into our heart. He needs no works <laughs> to prove it to him. And this is by faith alone because works are excluded. But a second kind of justification is the justification by works in the sight of God. Now wait. <laughs> You're right. In all of Scripture, that is nothing short of heresy, isn't it? Whether it's uh, Romans or Galatians, Paul makes it very clear that no one is justified in the sight of God by works alone. But there's a third kind of justification, and it's justification by works in the sight of people. People can't see into their hearts, but they can see our deeds, and that's what James is talking about. Three times he says that we are justified by works. He's responding to the man who says, show me, and he says, you can see faith in works. That's justification by works. It's in the sight of people. And as you're reading your New Living Translation, they unfairly add to the text to be made right in the sight of God. That phrase, in the sight of God, is not in the text. Fourth problem is in James 2.17. What about dead faith? <laughs> Surely dead faith must mean no faith, false faith, intellectual faith. I believe we're talking again about immature faith 
versus mature faith, and therefore a dead faith ought to be considered to be an immature faith. James has prepared us for this by saying in chapter 1 that faith that doesn't meet practical needs is a useless, worthless devotion to God. Is his point that it's worthless to get you to heaven? That is just so far from the point. James is practically oriented, not so theologically oriented. And he is saying that if you can't control your tongue, you can't meet the needs of widows and orphans, then you have a really impractical devotion to God. That's dead faith. It's true faith, but it's certainly weak. Another emphasis is in chapter 2 when he talks about the poor being rich in faith. Can you hear a false faith, true faith controversy? No. The opposite of rich faith isn't no faith. It's a poor faith, but it's still faith. And his readers have a poor faith. A very interesting parallel, I think, to James 2.17 that says, faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. And most commentators uh, show and think of this parallel with Romans 7, but don't make, make much of it. But notice how Romans says, 7 says, for apart from the law, sin was dead. Listen. Does that mean apart from the law, sin was not real sin? Sin was false sin, spurious sin. <laughs> no way. What is the author talking about? He's talking about sin being dormant and less active. Then the law came in and stirred it all up and all kinds of sin began. So the same is true for a dead faith. A faith that is inactive is a weak faith, and works come in and stir it up and energize it and give it new power. There are three lessons in this passage to summarize. First of all, speaking our faith without doing our faith cannot meet practical needs. Do you realize how easy it is for us to talk our faith and not do our faith? We actually believe, as Christians, that if we've talked about it, we've done it. We gather together on Wednesday night and we talk about prayer and we leave and we think we've prayed. We gather together on a Sunday morning and we talk about evangelism and we leave and we think we've done it. And we gather together and we talk about the need of the crisis pregnancy center and our stand against abortion and we think we've done it. I have a, an important point here. Do you know that there's one particular group that is most susceptible to talking our faith and not doing our faith? You know what group that is? Teachers and preachers. Why do I say that? Because this major unit in James 2.14 to 26 immediately is preceded by 3.1 that says, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren. You know the sad fact that seems to be an irony to me is that the very people that probably need this particular lesson the most are the very ones that are forcing on this text a theological issue that gives them an excuse not to do the good works that James is talking about. We need to hear the lesson of James chapter 2 on acting out our faith. Number two, faith which is invisible can be seen through our good works. You can see faith. Finally, number three, when good works are added to our faith, our faith in Christ is matured or perfected. R.T. Kendall has a very uh, helpful observation that fits, makes a fitting closing. He says this, quote, What startles me is the number of people who insist that one must have works to show he is saved, but who themselves have virtually nothing of the very works that James has in mind. They wish to use James as the basis of assurance by works, but not the kind of works that James has in mind, like caring for the poor, I have yet to meet the first person who holds or preaches that giving another those things which are needful for their body 
must follow faith to show that it is saving faith indeed. We prefer to be selective in our use of James. We who hold to the truth, this is my statement now, that's the end of quote, we who hold firmly to the truth that faith alone brings justification without any sorts, sort of uh, works added to it should not be guilty of Kendall's criticism. Let us lead the life, let us lead the way in good works flowing from love and the power of the Spirit. Let us energize our faith to its fullest. How do you energize your faith? The way I energize my faith is to add to my faith good works that meet practical needs. Now, I'm sorry that I was so long, <laughs> and we have just a few uh, minutes, I believe four minutes for questions, and I didn't leave a lot, but this is a difficult section to cover quickly, and I even then feel like I have left out quite a bit. Now, can, uh, maybe you have some questions that may be uh, helpful uh, for listeners on tapes and video. Uh, go ahead. Question right here. Do I feel comfortable by saying that we are sanctified by faith and works? Absolutely. My short answer? <laughs> That's exactly what James says. Your faith cannot mature if you're not actively uh, involved in doing good things. Uh, we need to see how often. Titus has a major theme of doing good works. Just so many books have major themes of doing good works. That we need to charge our people, he says, to be active and involved in doing good things. Another question. Yes, right here. You've told us what we're not, what this salvation isn't. And I'm wondering if, if obviously it's not being saved from hell, but somebody mentions in the book of James about the fact that we're going to be judged. Are we being saved from disappointment at the judgment seat of Christ? Are we being saved from living a worthless life? What are we being saved from? Mm -hmm. Uh, we try to say that we think that James 2.14 is probably talking about being delivered from an early physical death. There's some other possibilities. Uh, since judgment without mercy, which is true for a believer, is just immediately in the context, could it mean that we will be delivered from a merciless judgment at the judgment seat of Christ? I think that's a possibility. Zane mentions in his book that uh, there's no use of the word saved that way anywhere else that we know of. And uh, that is a criticism, I think, although it is directly related to the judgment that has just proceeded in 2.13. However, there's so much of a theme of death, physical death, throughout James, starting way back in chapter 1 when he says that sin, when it's conceived, gives, uh, lust, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin, and then when sin is matured, full-grown, it brings forth death. It seems to me if I have sin that is full grown, leads to death, the only possibility there is physical death. And so there's a lot in James about physical death. I wish we could go more into that, but I think that's the, probably the best solution. Uh, yes, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hart, this is a practical question. It's personal. You may not want to answer it, so that's fine. Okay, let's go on to another one. <laughs> <laughs> you serve on a uh, faculty of Bible teachers. Yes. Uh, you teach what you teach. Quite openly, you have written rather fully about it. You're an institution that has probably the most predominant lordship salvationist man on its board. How does that work in your practical <coughs> approach to your subject at Moody? Okay. Uh, the question is uh, being at Moody with someone on the board that has a, a lordship salvation position, uh, how does that affect my ministry at Moody? Uh, well, first of all, that person that you're talking about, if I feel confident who it is, has not been on the board for some four or five years. And uh, I don't know the issues as to why, but, uh, and I don't know that it was a conflict. Uh, I just know that he's not on the board now. Uh, we do have a variety uh, of uh, ranges in, at Moody Bible Institute on the issue of lordship. I don't know that anyone is radical on lordship salvation. There's some that I would call more mild on it and certainly uh, several that are free grace. So there is some uh, latitude, and uh, although there's that latitude, I am grateful that I have extreme freedom in the classroom to teach what I do. And so uh, I feel very comfortable being there with that freedom that I have. Very good question. Um, another, and our time may be up for the videos.
So we'll have a few more minutes. Okay. Bob? Just seeing you five minutes. Oh, okay. Um, another question. Yes, over here. Well, it also seems to tie in well, though, with the passage on the sower and the seed. Uh, when you're talking about the second and the third uh, seed situation, the plant itself appears to die. It cannot produce fruit. Dead faith is incapable of producing fruit also. Yes, I think I'd agree with that. Now, the one question that I've had uh, with James, and uh, be a good question for us all to ask uh, later on the other members of the panel, <laughs> is whether or not James would say that we are born again with a dead faith. Because all he, says, all he says in this passage is faith without works is dead. So there seems to be some possibility that, it's, so to speak, since I am born again with an immature faith that hasn't developed yet, I could say that I am born again with a dead faith because I don't have any works yet. And now others might suggest that the dead faith is only labeling those who have grown for a while and produced fruit and then something, some death has come into their faith because they are now resistant in doing the kinds of things that they should have done. And I think that's a very good possibility as well. I just did. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm wavering is what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, either of those uh, sound good to me. And... Uh, Yes, in the back here. Would you take a minute and address what your view is of the group that James himself is addressing in the letter and their particular circumstances on this? Uh, what is, the question is, uh, what is the group that James is addressing in the, the book that he's writing to? Uh, first of all, I would say they were Jewish. Second of all, they seem to be scattered. And so that would have caused some financial crisis of some sort in their life. And when money is a little tight, you long for it a little bit more. And I think that's part of the problem. I see that the group of people here is probably just as fleshly and worldly as maybe the Corinthians. And therefore, we have a, a very immature group. They may have grown for some time, but they're fighting and quarreling, it says. They have trouble with their tongue all the way through. They have difficulty with uh, God's generosity. They don't see his generosity. He is good to them. He's a giver of all good gifts. And therefore, they're, they are stingy because they don't see God as being generous either. They think of God as bringing the temptations on in their life rather than bringing the good gifts uh, to them. And so they don't see Him as a merciful God, and so they're not committing mercy to other people either. If they'd only see God as merciful to them, they would act in mercy to others. But He calls upon them to do that. They are very worldly, of course. We see that. Um, there's some... Uh, sickness among them. Uh, that gives you maybe a, a little picture of what they're like. Uh, they are gathering together, but there's clearly favoritism going on, giving special attention to the rich, uh, not giving the attention to the poor and the needy that they should, neglecting uh, the care of widows and orphans, and obviously many desiring to be teachers, thinking that, that the tongue was the way to express wisdom. And James says, no, you've missed it. The way to express wisdom is doing, acting, good things. Get back to that. And they are not doing the word like they should. It's a brief overview. Another question. Yes. Uh, you said you had freedom in teaching, and I assume then that uh, others have freedom also. I just wondered, uh, what, what, are there boundaries or limitations? Uh, um, Moody has a, uh, a doctrinal statement that's... Uh, um, I wouldn't say necessarily broad, but it doesn't, it, the, the doctrinal statement on salvation truly does not define within it the range of lordship that you can hold to or that kind of thing. Uh, but there have been a number of uh, people that have gone through perhaps uh, Dr. Ryrie over the years at Dallas and other places and have uh, a free grace mentality there that would not necessarily be exactly our flavor, but still is, is free grace. And so um, uh, there's nothing to say that they couldn't be a radical person. But I know uh, maybe as much as uh, eight or nine years ago, I had a debate with another professor uh, on the issue of Lordship Salvation. And he was what I might call a mild uh, kind of a person on Lordship. Mm -hmm. And we may have 30 seconds. Well, then, uh, yes. I did something on the uh, faith of demons in the journal, yes, but not all of the, the whole section, no. Mm -hmm. But uh, Bob made me have one in preparation. <laughs> I just didn't follow it today. <laughs> okay, let's close in a brief word of prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we are so grateful uh, to your goodness to us, your mercy.